Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Laquita. If you are new, I am a work from home certified medical coder with three certifications from the AAPC, ACPC, ACOC, and ACRC. I only code out of the ICD-10CM code set and I have been coding for five years now. So as you can see, it looks different over here. The last time I did my day in the life of a medical coder video, I had my two monitors here and I had my laptop that was all provided for my company. It's no longer here for a reason. And the reason that the equipment is not here is because I no longer work for that company. I spent almost five years there. That is the company that I started at with an apprentice. No working experience as a medical coder, put in a two weeks notice and I moved on from that company. I am eligible for rehire, but I don't plan to go back. I make my own hours. I can work any time of the day. As long as I get in the minimum set of hours that they have set for each coder to work, they have no issue with any time of the day that a coder works. They don't care where I work, meaning that if I decide to go out of town, I can still work. There are no restraints in that regard. They do not provide the equipment, which is not a problem for me. That's why the equipment that you saw here, this is my equipment, this is something that I've already had, and that's what I use to do my work. My title is an HCC coder. HCC stands for Hierarchical Condition Categories. Per the Google definition, which you're probably Googling right now, is HCCs or hierarchical condition categories are a set of medical codes that are linked to specific clinical diagnoses. You get it, right? You probably don't. This website linked in the description box below gives a pretty good explanation of what HCC coding is and why it's important. Some of you are so shocked to hear that. But the OGs know that I only code out of ICD-10-CM because you thought since you needed CPT, Higgs Fix Level 2, and ICD-10-CM to sit for the CPC exam, you thought that any job in the medical coding industry period that you needed all those books. No ma'am, I'm here to tell you that you do not. Not if you go the route that I went and that is risk adjustment. Let's talk about what I do in my new position. What's crazy is that I do not physically type in codes. Again, I do not physically type in any codes. I simply either validate or invalidate the code that is suggested by the system. So the software that I work off of is in-house software that was developed specifically for the organization that I work for. So no, I don't use Epic or anything like that. It's in-house software. The system recommends a code and I look at that code and then I look at the medical record and I can only code what is in the medical record. Meaning, for example, in the record, there's diabetes and there's PVD and diabetes and PVD is supported with a medication, is diagnosed and supported. If the system recommends diabetes E11.9, I cannot validate E11.9 because a casual relationship has been established between diabetes and PVD. So the code that would be coded or should be coded in the record is E11.51, not E11.9. So I will invalidate E11.9. That's how it goes. I never would have thought that I could work somewhere where I don't physically type in the codes. I'm just simply saying, click, this code is incorrect. Click, this code is incorrect. That is my day to day. We do not query any providers at all. No queries. The job is not stressful at all. So our charts are audited. And if we don't agree with that auditor, we must, of course, challenge it. And after we challenge it, of course, someone is going to come in and look at both sides. And a decision will be made on who's correct. We must adhere to 95% accuracy, which is pretty much standard in the medical coding community. And we must code 13 charts per hour. It's no micromanaging whatsoever. As far as the telehealth goes, in order for us to do those charts, it has to be audio and video. 
That is the rule because we do deal with Medicare charts. And that is the rule that with Medicare charts, it must be audio and video, not just audio. Some plans accept just audio, but ours have to be audio and video. If we come across a medical record and for that data service, it's a telehealth appointment and it's only audio. Every code, regardless if it's in the record or not, we have to invalidate it because that's an invalid encounter. Acute conditions, let's talk about that. Um, and this is pretty much standard, I guess, just as far as coding period. Acute conditions, like um, a lot of times in the medical coding world, you will see acute conditions. And if you see on the chart, clinician stated that this person has an acute MI. Acute is something that's happening right now. They're having the MI right now, the heart attack right now. In that case, we do not code that. That's something that we would have to invalidate. A lot of times you find providers, they, they will put like acute, 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 but really it's something that, had, that has happened in the past. That would be history. What I did just recently learn, and I did not know, I learned this today. If the MI has happened within four weeks, we are able to code the MI as acute. Never heard that in my life, but I heard that today. Yeah, so that's why I'm talking about it now. So I have rarely coded like, an acute condition in an office setting. I've really coded that because it's happening right then and there, like a pulmonary embolism, uh, stuff like that, like in a face-to-face -face office visit. You don't typically like really see that in an office visit. Acceptable provider is something, someone like physician assistant, of course, an MD doctor, a DO doctor, a nurse practitioner, those are acceptable providers and there's many others as well. Unacceptable providers are like LPNs, LVNs, medical assistants, and they are not acceptable providers. So if we're looking at an encounter, we see that it was signed by a medical assistant, then that entire like encounter for that data service, it's, we can't validate it. Y'all, I'm thriving there. I am thriving there. My quality, baby, listen, it is magnificent. My quality, my productivity, it is amazing. We just got our QA scores. I think I was at 97 point something. And then the week before that, I was at like 99. So I'm like, look, I got to keep it going because I don't want to, you know, drop below 97. But right now I'm at 97 and that's above 95. So I'm still adhering to quality numbers that they have set out for us and I am proud of that. I truly believe that my quality scores could be better because I did come across some mistakes that I know that the auditor made. But the issue is uh, for those certain charts, I forgot to write down the chart numbers. So I couldn't even go back and reference them. And I was not about to go through all the charts that I completed to try to, you know, search for those charts. No. So I just kind of like just let that go. But in the future, no, anything that I find that I know that is wrong, I'm going to make sure that it get challenged because of course that affected my quality and I truly believe that's why it's at 97 right now. Transparency, y'all. So the job I have now, I thought it was a scam. I thought it was a scam. I kept telling my husband that I don't believe this recruiter guy who is calling me. I do not believe a word he's saying because believe it or not, there are people who get scammed for looking for a job. Y'all, it happens out there. And the reason I thought it was fake, it was no interview process and it was no assessment. Yes, you heard that right. I did not have to interview and I did not have to do an assessment. They looked at my resume, was cool with my resume. They got my AAPC number from me. They wanted to just make sure that they verified my certifications and that they were still in good standing. I literally applied for this job on a Tuesday. I got a call from the recruiter, not even 10 minutes later. I was doing the onboarding paperwork the same day, training on Thursday, and started working in a live environment on Friday. That's how it went. Amazing. Listen, I have dealt with a bunch of recruiters in the job search, and that's unheard of. Literally applied for the job and got the job in less than 10 minutes. Literally. Literally. Actually still interviewing. I may keep this as a part-time. You have the option to work at part-time or full-time, whatever you choose. So I may keep it as a part-time if it's not a problem with, you know, the other employer that I may, you know, get on with and stuff. But yeah, I, I don't want to let this one go. For another position, I did take a coding assessment and we were supposed to score at least an 80. I scored a 90, but no interview. 
No interview. Y'all don't even know how I came across that situation. No interview. And they said that it's set to start in January. To speak more about this job, the start date they told me was in January, but I had not received an offer letter yet. But actually today I received the offer letter and they told me that I'm set to start at the end of the month. So with that being said, I may vlog this and give y'all a new day in the life with my new job that I start later this month in about two weeks. And what's so funny, it's like what I do now. The system recommends these codes and I see if they're in the record and I validate it or I invalidate it. Same exact thing. So let's talk about the training that I received for my current role. Y'all, the training was only two hours. You would think that, oh, training is a week or training is two weeks, three weeks. No, the reason that I feel that the job was no interview is because for one, the work is massive. They needed a lot of people. They did not have the bandwidth or the time to interview us. Everyone that they hired, you had to have at least or very, very close to five years of medical coding experience, but not just five years of medical coding experience, five years of risk adjustment coding experience. They basically looked for people who had all this experience, who they felt like they did not have to train very, very long and who could jump right into production and just start tackling the work. The company that I left, that I worked for for almost five years, I started there as a CPCA. So that's all I knew as far as working for a company. So I worked there, I worked there for so long, y'all, that you know how you just used to working somewhere and you feel that if you go somewhere else, things are just going to be different and you might hate it because you get used to something and you don't like change. I told myself that I couldn't thrive anywhere else. And I don't know why I told myself that. And you know how you work somewhere, they say that everyone who leaves, they want to come back. Like, haven't we all worked somewhere where they say that? You hear the horror stories of the places that some people work where they're micromanaging so bad. I think that's why I stayed there for as long as I did. This experience of working for another employer has been eye-opening for me. My productivity and quality is amazing where I'm at. I win most of my appeals. I set my own hours. I'm not micromanaged. Things are going good and it has increased my confidence of being able to branch out and look for other opportunities that may be even, you know, better. Um, it has increased my confidence in that regard. The coding knowledge that I gained from working at that old company has definitely prepared me well. In the next video on Miss Laquita, I cannot believe that I am doing a day in the life of a medical coder video. I would get stuff back from auditors and I'm like... No, ma'am. <laughs> Anytime you have DM and PVD diagnosed in the record and you have the med support, you are to code. And no matter how many times that they said that I was wrong, I stood firm on what I knew was right. Huge announcement. Making a career pivot, less brain work than medical coding. And no gatekeeping here. I decided to pivot into 